Hello, everyone. Looks like we have a few more people coming in, but uh, I think we're close to getting started here. Let everybody get seated. Uh, Happy New Year. Nice to see all of you. I hope everybody had a nice holiday and uh, had a chance to relax and uh, be with family and friends and uh, maybe some of you did some traveling um, and uh, got to eat some good food and uh, now you can start to work off all that food that you ate. <laughs> But uh, nice to have you all back here and uh, looking forward to seeing our students arrive. I hope they'll do a better job than the crows who arrived last night here uh, <laughs> and left uh, some dreamy deposits on every surface of the ground uh, around the school. Um, but uh, I, I, I actually love seeing the crows when they come back to Min Minneapolis in the wintertime. And, uh, this is one of the places that they stop on their sort of migration around town looking for a place to sleep at night. Um, you just have to make sure your car is not parked underneath one of those trees. <laughs> um, so uh, today um, I just wanted to say a, a brief welcome, but I'm going to make a, a brief presentation a, a little bit later, but I wanted to have Pam uh, Newsom come up uh, because we have a guest that Pam's going to introduce and I wanted to give our guest a chance to g go ahead of everybody else. So, Pam. Hello. I'd like to introduce Bill Thorne from TIAA CREF. We have asked him to come out and talk about the award-winning website that TI Cref has. Uh, in fact, we were talking before the program, one of our staff people had mentioned they'd gone out to just look up something on the website and ended up spending an hour going through all the different things that they have on there. Uh, as you came in, you may or may not have seen also a handout that Bill brought with him. Um, so grab one of those on the way out. Even if you're not in our pension plan, you can participate through a supplemental retirement annuity. So if you're not on the pension plan, don't tune out. Do uh, ask any questions that you have after Bill has spoken. Uh, Bill is the Director of Institutional Business Field Consulting Group for the Midwest. He has a list of certifications, as long as your arm that I won't go through. So instead, I will... Give him the floor. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, and I'm uh, certainly not going to spend anywhere close to an hour. I'm just going to spend a few minutes going through a few touches of our, our website to give you an idea of how the website works, and with that, um, the ability to hopefully turn it on here and once we get started maybe it went to sleep let me check here here we go so what I want to really show you on the website is some of the capabilities not to show you exactly how everything works but maybe to entice you a little bit to do as one of your coworkers did and just go out and spend a little bit of time on it there's a lot of great information here and it's, it's really trying to help you in your, your financial planning, whether it be for retirement or any other different goal. This is our core public website, the home page. It's at tiaacref.org, so tiaa-cref.org. And yes, we are a .org organization, so we are all salaried employees working as a not-for-profit organization here to help you and serve you. So we're not here to sell you stuff. We're just here to help you with your financial services. Um, our basic site has a lot of great information on it, but I'm going to point out a couple of specific items that I think are most helpful. Our advice and guidance tab gives you a wealth of information on a variety of different topics, and really all you have to do is kind of just go out and look for it. Over on the left-hand side, you see a number of topics, things like retirement, investing, insurance, budgeting, etc. Let's say, for example, maybe you were going to do some budgeting information. 
Um, let me re relaunch your uh, website. Apparently, I'm been sitting here too long. Maybe not. Well, let me take it through you through the demo site that I've got set up here too. The demo site, you'll have to forgive me, I don't get to pick the account balances. I think we all wish we had this account balance at the top of our screen when we log in. But when you go to our home page and click log in, you type in an ID number and a password, and this is your home screen. So how, how many of you have actually gone in and looked at your, your home screen page? But this is kind of what it looks like now. So it gives you right at the top your account balance. And if you've been with us for a while, a long while, you have a nice account balance like this one. It also right below that shows you, and this is brand new, your projected income at retirement. Here at TI Craft, we really believe that it's not about what a balance is, it's really about what kind of income you can replace, because that's really what retirement is about, is being able to replace the income that you have while you're working. So you hear a lot of commercials about what's my number in terms of a, a lump sum, but it's really hard to recognize what that lump sum means unless you turn it into an income amount that's really what you're going to be replacing. So we really talk more in terms of income rather than account balances. But within this information, you've got a number of different ways you can find out more and more about your account. And as you scroll down the page, you can look at your account balance over time. You can switch it into a table form versus a graph form. You can look at it from an asset class perspective if you like pictures better than, you know, than words and numbers. If you want to look at it purely from an investment standpoint, you can do that as well. It gives you just a lot of different information. As you scroll down the page, it kind of gives you, think of it as the top of the page working at the bottom of the page, kind of the good weird blimp view from the top where you're seeing just sort of everything combined. Then as you scroll down the page, you're able to go more definitively into your, either your defined contribution and your tax deferred annuity if you've got multiple accounts or whatever the case might be. In this sort of example, there's, there's multiple accounts here that this person has just as an example, but you'll notice a big section here talking about personal rate of return. So a lot of people like to know this is great, but how am I doing individually? And one of the things you're able to do with that is, is really get a sense of how your allocation is moving along. Oops, now I'm still having trouble with my server. My apologies. Let me reconnect here real quick. There we go, sorry for that. So again, a lot of information on your account balance, your personal rate of return is, is another availability that, that a lot of people like to know is how am I doing individually from a performance standpoint, meaning my mix of investments. I've chosen this much to put in stock and bonds and real estate and so forth. What is that really doing for me? How am I mixing that money up? Is it getting a good overall rate of return? I know what each fund is doing. I can look at the fund performances and see that, but it really comes more back to how am I doing individually on my account. And the personalized rate of return will tell you how you're doing. So it's giving your overall portfolio, in this case, again, hypothetically, a, a positive 8.4%. I think right now this year we all would love an 8.4% positive return with the way the stock market's been acting lately, but it's a way of getting that kind of information for yourself. Um, the other things that I wanted to show you here are some of the tools, which I was going to before, under this Advice and Guidance tab. So again, you've got a lot of the different topics and overview information that you can look at. Then you've got some of our tools, and you can go right to our tools and calculators, which can be as simple as just 
a time value of money calculator. Give you an idea if you put so much away at a certain amount of return, how much would that accumulate? Two much more complex tools that are actually very, very easy to use that deal more with um, telling you how well and how on time you're planning for retirement and how on target you are for your retirement. So this is the screen I was showing you before in terms of the present personal rate of return for the year to date, one year, three year, and five year dates. And you can, again, chart it or, or graph it depending on how you want to see it. You can go back and look at it over past years to see how your account's been doing historically and so on, how you survived different you know, recessionary periods, how you did when the market was going up. This gives you a lot of flexibility to see not just how the individual funds you're sitting in, but your overall portfolio, which is something people have always really wanted to do and wanted to be able to see, and now you, you can through your TIKREF account. One of the tools I think is most helpful to people is what we call our Retirement Advisor account. And this is one I encourage everybody to utilize because it really helps you show how on target you are for retirement and then gives you a very specific recommendation of what you can do to help improve your probability of reaching your retirement goals. And it's a simple idea of setting your goals, entering some information, picking your strategy, and then going ahead and deciding whether you want to take action on that or not. And there's even a little easy button that just puts everything in place if you want to go ahead and, and do that. So to give you a quick example of this, the first bit of information you put in is just quickly your salary information for you and your spouse or partner. Then you continue on. And the nice part about doing this after you've logged into your own account is we already know a lot of information about you, so we're going to pull all that in for you. You're not going to have to re-enter all that. But one thing we do want you to identify is how much of your income, for the example of this illustration, do you want to replace in retirement? We tend to default to the 100% number, but you can use this little slider and kind of put it wherever you want, from 80% to 120% or back again, whatever you're most comfortable with. And you can do different examples, different illustrations, and, and test it out at different levels and see how, how on target you are. Then again, as I mentioned, it's going to pull in all of your existing data. So in this case, this person has a bunch of different accounts with us, so they're going to pull all that in. But if you wanted to add any more accounts, you can absolutely do that as well. So if you have an outside IRA or a prior employer's 401k plan, you can add those numbers in. We'll take those into account, but we're not going to tell you to invest that money. We're just going to complement your TI CREF investment based on what you have invested elsewhere. In addition to that, we can take into account Social Security or any other retirement or pension plans that you have, and then, again, project that along. And what we end up doing is giving you an idea of, first of all, in the green bar, what your goal is currently in terms of replacing your income. Then secondly, based on what you're doing right now, if everything stayed the same and you just continued on that pattern, where would that put you? Where would you be by the time that you reach retirement age? And then the bottom, the purple line, is really our recommendation saying, here's what we would recommend to improve your probability of reaching those goals and being on target. Then if you want to see more detail of what that recommendation is all about, you can scroll down to the bottom and take a look at it. So in this example, again, you see your current situation, what you're currently doing. Then you're seeing the proposed strategy and what it's recommending. If you want to see what that means, you can hit the view the action plan piece, and it gives you an assessment of your current allocation and then assessment of the allocation that it's recommending for you. As you scroll down further, it gives you even more detail. So it's not just telling you how much to put in stocks and bonds and real estate, but actually taking you and looking at all the individual investments that you have here at Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and would tell you what your current allocation is, how much your current allocation would change in terms of transferring existing monies to those new balances, and then going forward, how we would recommend your contributions for new money going into the account would be allocated. And so we're specifically giving you a recommendation on a fund-by-fund -fund basis. So it's a very customized approach, giving you a very specific allocation for your needs based on your timeline to retirement and based on your outside assets that you have as well. Ultimately, if it's something you want to go ahead and do, you've got this little reallocate now button, which is kind of the easy button. So you don't have to go into your accounts and try to figure out the names of the funds and where to put it. You would just say, yeah, this makes sense to me. I want to go with this allocation. Hit reallocate now, and it'll do that rebalancing for you. <clears throat> the only thing we can't do is change your contribution amount. That you'd have to do directly here with, with MCAT, but that's something that absolutely can be updated as well. The other thing I wanted to show you here is let's say you have this 
proposed strategy, but you say, and again, hypothetically, moving from 650 a month to 940 a month, that's a huge jump in, in savings. I can't do that right now, but maybe I could go to 750 and make that kind of a jump. Well, you could click the try another strategy option, plug in the amounts you're more comfortable with or the investment mix that you're more comfortable with. Maybe you don't want to go to very aggressive. Maybe you want to go to moderately aggressive. And then hit the calculate, recalculate button, and it'll recalculate for you and show you what that would do for you. And it may not get you all the way to that objective, but it'll get you part of that way. And every step is helpful. So it'll, it'll do something that's more workable for you, but that you can reach and give you an idea of how much that'll get you closer to those goals. And again, you can redo these anytime you want. In fact, we recommend every few years you come back in and redo these. And this is something that's available online. It's available over our phone with our phone consultants as well as sitting down face to face with one of our financial consultants. And Mark Thompson's coming out here next month on the 18th and 19th to sit down with people individually as well. And we have our office down the road in Bloomington that's available for you to set up meetings with us at any time as well. And keep in mind, those meetings are absolutely no additional cost at all to you. They're just there, part of the service, part of the benefit. Feel free to take advantage of them. Again, the consultants are all salary. They're not there to push product on you. They're just simply there to assist you with your retirement planning goals. Let me go back one other area here. And then just to finish up, I wanted to just show you that we also have a number of different um, communities that we have available. So you'll notice sort of over on the right-hand side here, we've got a women's to women community, starting your financial life, which is kind of for the, the Gen Y group. And then also down here at the bottom of the previous column, we've got the myretirement.org for those folks who are nearing or into retirement. And all these are online communities where you can talk to and chat with financial professionals or peers of your own that are working with financial issues that are the same kind of struggles and challenges that you're dealing with and working to find answers and ways to, to resolve those kinds of topics. And it's really a, a wonderful opportunity to kind of share ideas and, and get some advice from others who are experiencing very much the same things that you are. So again, just a quick overview, a quick idea of what's going on with our website. I also wanted to quickly announce to you that we are actually going through a, a brand uh, re-establishment re or a brand re relaunch here next month. And while it's actually still kind of a hush-hush thing, the marketing folks don't want me to tell anything about it and haven't told me much about it, I did want to give you sort of a, one lead-in that, that's coming up that I think will be really a big plus, and it's something we call our um, virtual environment. And basically what that means is we will be providing a lot of content and information in a virtual environment. So it'll be kind of like going to a, an exhibit hall or an auditorium uh, virtually, and you'll be able to kind of pick and choose from a variety of different topics or webinars and take a look at them and visit them and get a sense of signing up for different meetings or if you weren't able to attend the meeting you can listen to the recordings if you just want information so for example you can choose a location like the plaza <clears throat> which gives you this kind of virtual exhibit hall kind of aspect. So you can go to the exhibit hall, you can go to the resource center, you can go to the auditorium or the networking lounge. So, so for example, if you click on the auditorium, it takes you to a whole series of presentations that are scheduled for the first quarter of 2016. And maybe you're interested in getting some information on social responsible investing, or maybe you're interested in an economic update. You can sign up for these different webinars and, and the comfort of your own computer, kind of sit and watch them. Um, maybe you, it's a little different. Maybe you're more in the idea of not quite sure what you're looking for. So you want to go to our exhibit hall. And within the exhibit hall, you've got a variety of different topics that you can touch upon and look at. Maybe you're investing for your future, looking at living in retirement. Maybe you're looking at some of the other topics that we have, planning for today and tomorrow 
spending time with spending within your means, excuse me, it's kind of more of a budgeting type of topic and so on. And all these different exhibit halls then have additional resources as you go into them, as well as a series of webinars that you can sign up for as well. So all of this will be kind of rolling out with this new bland, brand relaunch. And being at the College of Art and Design, I thought it would be something interesting is, if some of you want to kind of pay attention to our website over the next few months, you will see a number of things happening on that website, including kind of a changeover of our, of our bland, brand logo and so on. And just see what one company's perspective is on how they, how they handle that. Um, most don't know what's happening yet, so you're kind of giving a little bit of a preview. Uh, I don't think it's going to be anything dramatic, but I'm sure it is something that uh, will be um, something very important to, to a large company like this and for your future career, something that I know we've spent a heck of a lot of money on. So it's something that uh, is, is a great opportunity as, as artists to get involved with. <clears throat> with that, any questions, comments, concerns, things you'd like to maybe learn a little bit more about real quickly? or Anything I might have missed that you had in your mind? I have a question. Yep. We did scope out the allocations that you can move them, but can you also confirm that there are some allocations that cannot be moved back, meaning the guaranteed fund? Yeah, we have one fund called the TIA Traditional, which is a guaranteed account. And with that guaranteed account, we're giving you a, a minimum rate of return. So it can never go below. So regardless of what happens in the market conditions, it's always going to pay 3% rate of return. In order for us to give you that 3% rate of return on guaranteed money right now, uh, it has to be in an investment that's fairly long term and maturing or, or maturing over a longer term time period. And the only way to hold those rates of returns is to hold those investments for that longer term. So it is something that is more restrictive when you go to take it out. So you can take it out, but it has to be taken out in segments. It can't be taken out as a lump sum. So it has to be taken out over time, and it, depending on the timing of, of when you do it and how you want to do it will affect the timing. But for the most part, think of it as a more long-term investment, something you're more likely going to be using in retirement than something that's going to be a short-term change. If you don't feel you need any guaranteed investment in your, your allocation right now, then it wouldn't be a place to be. But for most retirees, they survive with a very healthy portion of their money in guaranteed investments. And certainly with the market volatility going on right now, if you look at our TI traditional account, it's actually one of the top performers over the last 10 years compared to most funds because it doesn't have that volatility. Whereas in high performing years, it's not going to keep pace with the you know, double digit stock market. It is going to get you a 4 to 5% return over the long term, which is you know, a very stable, safe, risk-free kind of investment. And for a lot of investors, there's a segment of your portfolio that you're going to want to have that type of investment in. But when you do put money in that type of investment, that is something definitely to be aware of. And there is a little pop-up window that shows you that when you go to transfer money in or put money in that account that shows you that it is going to be a more restrictive account when you try to come back out. Correct. Thank you, Pam. That's a great thing to point out. So you have two different accounts. You have the retirement plan as the pension or, or defined contribution plan, and that's where you see that restrictive account. Then you also have a voluntary tax-sheltered annuity account or supplemental retirement account where it's voluntary money that you yourself are putting in, and that one has no restrictions at all. That one you can move in and out of like any other account. So it's really just the one retirement plan that pays a little bit higher interest, but gives you that guarantee of that higher interest rate for a little bit more inflexibility from a, from a liquidity standpoint. The real estate account you can pull out anytime you want, but you can't do it more than quarterly. And that's because real estate is just a little slower to sell. So you, every quarter you could take as much as you want, but if you took it out today, you couldn't go ahead and do it again tomorrow. Yes? The uh, monthly uh, payout that you showed earlier, I think it's 5000 whatever, um, does that factor in or not factor in Social Security? So what we were showing before, I think this was on the actual MyTIACREF Homepage. Let me bounce right back to that real quick to show you which number we're talking about. So this number here kind of projecting your retirement income. So yes, it is going to include Social Security. And this one is actually assuming that you're retiring at age 67. And so there's, there's a set of assumptions here. And if you say, how do I know if I'm on track and, and click into this, there's more information here. It will give you all those assumptions in terms of how that's calculated. But in this case, yes, we are going to combine both your retirement plan and your Social Security benefit, knowing that you do have Social Security as part of this 
job not every of our participants do, but um, combining the two together and estimating what that's going to be as well. Yeah, very good point to make. Yes, very back. Very good. So every plan has a plan number. So here you see the fund watch section. So one of the things you can do is customize your watch list. So maybe you want to go in and set up all of your own funds that you're investing in on this watch list, and right at the bottom of the page, it shows you how much or what that fund has done from day to day. But you can also go to the performance tab here, choose retirement assets or annuities, excuse me, hit go. And then from your statement or your online account, or if you just remember it, the Minneapolis College of Art and Design has a plan number that is 365671. And it's not a number I expect any of you to remember because I don't remember it either, but it's, it's one that is on your statement and it's on your account. You'll see it in any of your plans. And then it customizes your portfolio because what we have now is basically every institution we work with really pretty much has kind of their own customized portfolio of investment options. And here at, at Minneapolis College of Art and Design, you do as well. So here you see all the funds that are available to you under the plans that you have. So you can look at the bond fund, the equity fund. So the top here you see our core annuity accounts. And as you scroll down the page, you get into some of the other TI traditional accounts, as well as the, the um, life cycle funds and so on. And you can see their performance histories. As you see right now, you see a lot of red numbers because of what the market's been doing the last couple of weeks here since the year started. These are year-to-date and one-year returns, the first two columns. Um, <clears throat> so you see things like a bond doing a little bit better, stock certainly suffering the most at this point. Um, I mentioned before the guaranteed accounts, they're up at 4%, 3.9%, doing a bit better just because they're guaranteed and they can't go any lower than that. But um, every fund has its difference. I really wouldn't focus on the short-term results. I'd really look at the long-term results. This is retirement money. You don't want to be making adjustments based on the knee-jerk reactions to the markets. It really doesn't pay off. I would instead have a, a plan in mind, a diversification in mind, use that retirement advisor or the, the life cycle style, style funds and kind of let it run and, and let it follow these ups and downs. They do tend to be reactive. They do tend to happen quickly when they move. So being in and out of the markets at the right times is exceptionally difficult to do. So kind of riding it out has usually proven to be the better action, even though it's painful at times to kind of watch it. But you think of it as employees, you're making new contributions, you're buying in at these lower points. You're getting everything on sale right now. Everything's cheaper than it was a couple months ago. You're buying more shares, more units of these funds. And with that, it'll help you rebound that much more quickly when the market turns around and comes back up again once things in China stabilize. I think I saw another question out there. Yeah. So TIA and CREF, and this may actually come up with the brand relaunch because we might be kind of simplifying the name, but TIA stands for Teachers Insurance Annuity Association. That was the original company that Andrew Carnegie founded back in 1918. And then the CREF part stands for College Retirement Equities Fund. And that came about in 1952 when TI CREF developed the first variable annuity in, in the industry. So the two are kind of joined together. The TIA portion is typically the guaranteed part. The craft portion is the variable part you see with all the other funds. Kind of a long, drawn out name, but they need to simplify it. So. Any other questions? Well, very good. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate it very much. I just have a few very quick announcements. As was mentioned, we will be having one-on-one -on -one meetings that you can sign up for within the next couple of weeks. We'll send out an email. Those are 45 to 60 minutes long. Most people find those to be one of the better benefits that we offer because it is individualized and you can ask any question that you have about your funds. 
I also want to introduce a new staff person. I'm not sure if he's here or not. Brian Johnson, our new custodial supervisor. No, oh shoot. Well, if you see somebody walking the halls that looks like they belong here, but you don't recognize them, maybe that's him. Um, want to remind you that we have a wellness program starting again in February. There are no changes to the program. It's the same as we've always had. Uh, if you participate, by filling out the assessment, the health assessment, and finishing a program, there is a reward again next year of either a reduced deductible or a copay. We find our biggest recruiting tool for that plan is people who don't do it and then the next year wish they had. So you might want to just skip all that wishing and just go ahead and do it um, so you don't have to worry about it. It's good for you and it's good for our, our overall health plan too. Um, also, I feel like a mom up here. Did you all do your training on sexual harassment and sexual violence? All these reminders today. Um, last November, we sent out an email to everyone who was uh, either a regular or adjunct employee asking you to finish about a 45 to 60 minute training module. It, the original email came from me telling you that you would also be getting an email from something called Workplace Answers. Got a lot of emails back from people saying, is this a scam? Is this for real? It is for real. We are required by law to have you take the training. We will start the reminders again in February. So if you haven't completed it, you'll start getting little notes every week saying, would you please finish this, please? Um, if you are new, we will be sending out an email in February to give you the opportunity to complete the training as well. It is really helpful for all of us to have a shared vocabulary and a shared understanding of these concepts. It's very similar to the training that's being required of the students. So if you have any questions about that, please send me an email. And then lastly, the Affordable Care Act. I think you've all heard about that. Um, this year, for the first time, employers and health plans are, retire are required to send you out a form. And that form was supposed to come out by the end of January so you could include it with your taxes to prove that you had insurance and not get a fine. The government has realized how difficult those forms are and has delayed the due date till the end of March so you are no longer required to file those forms with your taxes. We will be sending out a form to you anyway by the end of January. It shows whether or not you were in our health plan for any given month during the year. Um, you'll also get one from Health Partners listing whoever you had on your plan for every month of the year. So I'm primarily just now saying don't throw those out. You'll get a lot of emails telling you what they are, when they're coming, but don't throw them out when you get them. Questions? I know it'll be confusing when you do get them, so we'll answer questions you have then as well. Yes? They should be, Brian? Yeah. Brent? Yes. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Pam. Um, so I. Uh, Actually, I'm going to just go back to that and uh, first say thank you to everyone on the staff and faculty who participated in Tuesday's uh, transgender workshops. Uh, and thanks to Karen, Jen, and Barb for putting that together. I really appreciate that. I think it was a really wonderful session. And uh, thank you for your work on that. Um, I just want to go over some numbers from this year's art sale. Uh, they're not absolutely final, so the, you know, don't hold me to these or don't hold hope to these. Um, but we had, uh, I'm just going to slide this over. Um, we had uh, 370,000 in uh, total revenue from the art sale, which is a record. Uh, we had 61,000 uh, of ticket sales, which uh, was also a record. Um, sponsorships were a little over 7,300. Uh, we had 452 artists who participated. 267 of those were current students, and 185 were uh, young alumni up to five years out of school. Um, 
$244,000 from the sale of the artwork went directly to the student participants. So, uh, you know, this in some sense, even though we don't call it scholarship funding, is as good as scholarship funding because it's money in students' pockets. And it's also money in the pockets of young alumni who are starting their career. So very beneficial for uh, both those groups. Um, of that, 36000 uh, after expenses uh, is going into the Art Sale Endowed Scholarship Fund, which is, uh, with that money, will have grown to a balance of around 150000 in the Art Sale Endowed Scholarship Fund. So that was just started a few years ago. I think maybe four years ago is Hope around to verify that. Uh, Hope, not here. Um, but uh, I think that was started about four years ago. Uh, prior to that, it was just going into the general operating funds, but I uh, really thought we should be putting it into scholarships. And so I'm very happy to see that this has grown to that amount. Um, so it gives off about 7,500 a year in scholarship funding and will continue to grow as long as we continue to feed it through the art sale. So very, very exciting. Um, I just have a few uh, statistics here that um, are somewhat random, but I think somewhat interesting uh, for us to think about. Um, by 2018, 63% of all U.S. jobs will require some level of post-secondary education. That's a lot of the work that's out there that will require a college degree. Um, and we will be short in 2025, 16 million college educated people to fill the needs of those kinds of jobs that will be out there in 2025. So what I take away from this is that the need for young people to get a college education is growing and the need for our economy to have college educated students continues to grow. So what we do is a benefit to uh, the country, um, and what we do is obviously also a benefit to our own students. However, just to put it into perspective, China graduates more students than America and India combined. Um, so the Chinese are producing the vast majority of college graduates globally. Um, and in America, a college education is becoming less the requirement uh, with 14% of the workforce having postgraduate degrees. And I think probably in this room, we represent uh, a kind of disproportionate number of those people but you know, still 14% of people, and that number continues to grow because the expertise that's required to enter into the workforce or move up in the workforce continues to require post-secondary education. So uh, interesting to think about. Um, and what about inequality in higher education? Between 1970 and 2011, the top income tier of uh, Americans' families um, went from 40.2% of those people in that t category of top tier to 71.2% getting a college degree, whereas the bottom quartile uh, by income in the U.S. went from 6 to roughly 10%. So you can see that that disparity between higher income and lower income people continues to grow over time in terms of people who are completing a college ed education and therefore people who are going to be able to par participate in the economy that America and the rest of the world is moving towards in the future. Um, and one of the main reasons that students leave, this is a, a national reason, um, you know, although we have uh, I, 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 a lot of our students are saying they're leaving for uh, health reasons, um, but some of those health me reasons may be due to the stress of work, uh, needing to work to make money to complete their education. And so one of the reasons people leave 
their college education or step out of it or maybe never return to it is because they need to make money. And stepping back into it is a difficult challenge. Once you start to get a paycheck, you know, the idea of going back and finishing college becomes uh, much more um, unlikely. And so also, what kind of a world are our students going out into? Um, a lot of them will be going to get jobs in companies, but a lot of them will be joining this 1099 or gig economy workforce that is uh, growing uh, continuously. That means they'll be independent contractors, which means they'll have a lot of flexibility, um, they'll have a lot of freedom in terms of what they choose to do or not to do, uh, which all sounds very good. Um, they will need adaptable skills, they'll probably need multiple skills, and they'll need some business knowledge to be able to operate within that environment. Um, and they'll be at the vagaries of supply and demand. You know, what they thought they could make some money yet, you know, for a year or two may dry up and therefore they need another skill to be able to sort of slip into something else that will make them some money um, or they're gonna slip back. Um, and unfortunately, they've got the challenge of not having a secure safety net. It's one thing for all of us to talk about TIA CREF, TIA CREF accounts, um, but when you're in the gig economy, uh, you don't have uh, a pension contribution that's being made on your behalf and you don't have a pension set up like that, um, nor may you have health care. So it's a challenging economy that our students are going out into. And I think as educators, we need to be aware of that and we need to prepare our students for that world that they may be facing. Um, so I, I just want to talk about some uh, strategic uh, opportunities, uh, strategic direction that we're, we're looking at. Um, I don't want to go over all of these opportunities, but um, you know, certainly strengthening our current academic programs is important. Um, aligning ourselves with the direction of the creative economy is important. Um, the, to the extent that we can increase relationships with for-profit and non-profit businesses, it will have advantages for our students. Um, they will understand more about the world that they're going into. They will have had experience uh, hearing directly from people in those uh, worlds that they'll be interacting with uh, as graduates, uh, as people uh, seeking jobs, whether it's uh, in a company or uh, seeking to be um, uh, an independent contractor working with many of those companies. Um, and we need to continue to incubate uh, the fine arts students that will help uh, nurture the broader culture. And look at what it means to be a fine artist today, uh, which has uh, evolved from I'm going to graduate, I'm going to paint, I'm going to get a gallery, and live off of my work, that may work for some of our students, but others may be employing their fine arts skills for a variety of other reasons uh, to make a living and to have a creative and meaningful life. Um, we have a number of challenges, um, keeping uh, MCAT affordable, uh, limited college funds for new initiatives, which is Cindy will talk a little bit uh, in a few minutes about um, the uh, uh, fundraising that we've been doing, um, changing student demographics. Um, you know, not only do we have right now, we're sort of in a trough of students graduating from high schools, but we also have uh, students in high schools who are more and more students of color, uh, not uh, the students that we were getting 10 and 20 and 30 years ago. Um, we have increased competition for enrollment um, and also sort of internal issues that we have to work on with respect to retention. Um, we need to provide competitive salaries for faculty and staff going forward so that we can attract people and retain people here. Um, we're living in a volatile economy. You've all watched the stock market bounce around, and I'm sure we all wish we had won Powerball last night, but uh, unfortunately, my four tickets went to waste like many of yours may have. Um, 
And uh, we're in a world of a lot of change with government regulations and programs. Uh, the Pell Grant, for example, uh, got renewed for another two years, but that could very well go away, and that's a source of funding for our students. Um, and then we have on our own campus deferred maintenance, which um, we chip away at over the last uh, probably seven years. We've uh, spent about $10.4, $10.7 million on deferred maintenance across the campus uh, and moder modernization projects. But despite that, we still have about $36 million of deferred maintenance um, from a study that we did that we update on an annual basis. Um, so how does MCAD work to keep uh, college affordable? Um, we've increased our institutional financial aid from 5.8 million in 2010-11 to 10.8 million for this academic year. Um, so we are plowing a lot more of our institutional resources into funding for our students. Um, and scholarship funds, uh, we've gone from roughly 336,000 in scholarship funds raised from outside sources to uh, almost a million two in scholarship funds over that same time period. So we're uh, not only adding uh, institutional funds to this, but we're also adding external funds to uh, support our students as well. Uh, who are our top? competitors well there's there's a list uh, top by Savannah uh, and at the bottom Maryland uh, Institute uh, in in Baltimore um, you see the University of Minnesota is our you know truly local local competitor but also regionally we are competing with uh, Milwaukee and Kansas City and um, uh, the School of um, the Art Institute in Chicago as well uh, so, you know, to compete with them, it's not just a financial thing, but it's also reinvesting in our uh, programs uh, and in our facilities uh, to attract students. Um, this, which uh, I'm not sure all of you in the back row can read this, but um, there is a bold line sort of a little below halfway down the middle there. That's Minneapolis College of Art and Design. And this is a ranking of uh, colleges in the ACAD consortium by tuition and fees for this year. So at the top of that list is Pratt Institute um, at 46,586 um, for each student. Um, that's not after financial aid. But, uh, and at the bottom is the Pennsylvania College of Art and Design at 22,800. Uh, and MCAD, um, sort of in the middle to, in, and we haven't wavered much from this. We've gone up or down one or two in our sort of ranking. And it's also interesting to see that largely these rankings have to do with bigger schools um, charge more money, smaller schools charge less money. So seeing ourselves in the middle isn't a big surprise. Um, so I just want to talk about some of our strategic priorities, um, strengthening academic programs, and just going through some of the timelines for these. So. Um, we are seeking approval for a project to build out the entrepreneurial study space, um, refresh the animation space, and also refresh the fine art studios on the third floor. Um, and it's a $2.87 million project. Um, and we are waiting for uh, some information on some grant funding that we're looking for. and. Uh, assuming that we are successful with that funding and some additional funding we need to raise, we're hoping to get board approval in May, um, and if not in May, by next October to move forward with this project uh, to complete the build out by fall of 2017. Uh, during the summer, uh, and we've done the timeline, just so you know, we would not have to uh, shorten spring break, so everybody can breathe a sigh of relief there. Um, uh, moving the MFA program back to campus, Karen's going to show some slides of its uh, move uh, to the uh, space just down the street. But um, 
We are beginning preliminary budgeting, uh, sort of estimating the size of the uh, sustainable size of the graduate program going forward. Um, uh, and uh, the, looking at working with James Dayton Design on plans for where it might go here on campus at what cost uh, and helping to have a range of those costs available for the board uh, and the college to look at uh, at the end of this coming spring. Um, and in order to meet uh, the needs of the program based on the contract that we have for the space that we're currently in, we would have to complete this project by the summer of 2020 for a fall move-in date um, uh, by the graduate students from their current location to a location on campus. Um, we're looking at a product design program as an addition to the school. We just got the results of a survey um, and so uh, what the timeline will be for this is really pending on uh, reviewing that survey and uh, reviewing the costs associated with starting this program uh, and the realistic timeline for it uh, in terms of accreditation uh, and a lot of other issues that uh, are part of starting a new program at the college. Um, but this program would, I think, um, uh, you know, be a complement to what we're doing in furniture design, to what we're doing in sculpture, and a product class that's being run in the illustration department, um, uh, but give more visibility to the potential uh, and uh, create opportunities for students who learn those skills to go out into the workforce here, which has a lot of product design opportunities um, uh, within this region, uh, let alone across the country. Um, and then student health and wellness, and I also include diversity in that. So we're looking at a plan for how we address the needs of our students from a perspective of mental health um, and wellness, uh, physical health and wellness to a certain degree as well, um, but also how we address the diversity of the campus. And certainly uh, the Tuesday uh, talk uh, and workshop around transgender students um, students of color, uh, you know, Karen gave quite a uh, comprehensive list of all the student uh, organizations that are focused on this and, um, you know, the ways that we need to respond as an institution to address the needs of uh, these uh, very uh, different student groups um, uh, and, and, you know, I, th I think also address the needs of diversity uh, and health and wellness for all of us um, are extremely important. Um, we have some other ac academic initiatives that we're moving forward on. I won't go into details about these articulation agreements, competency-based credits that we're looking at, online and hybrid programs, and expansion of continuing education programs. Uh, to include more badging and certificate programs. Um, and then finally this spring, we will have our reaccreditation process with HLC, which I'm sure you are a little sick of hearing about, but it's a really important process for us. Uh, and they will have a campus visit here on April 4th and 5th. Um, and uh, I just was on the phone with uh, Colin O'Neill today about that. Um, and. Uh, we should have our report completed uh, in time for uh, a re review of it um, in order to be able to send it out to uh, HLC on March 4th. So I think we're in quite good shape in terms of our preparations for this, although there's still a lot to do, as Karen, I'm sure, would <laughs> attest. Um, so uh, any questions about anything I've presented or any questions about anything uh, beyond what I presented? Yes, Laura. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Yep, you're right. Yep, Perkins. Yep, yep. Thanks for that correction. It is a Perkins uh, loan grant program. Um, but speaking of the Pell Grant, we have about 34% of our students are Pell Grant eligible. So we are really serving a lot of that bottom tier of the economic um, part of America in, in terms of uh, students who come to the school. But thank you, Laura. 
Anybody else? Anything else? Corrections, comments, questions? Okay, um, Karen. I think mine end might be a little shorter because Jay covered a lot of my Sorry. stuff. That's okay. <laughs> we don't check our scripts ahead of time. Um, first, to show off the new space, the uh, newly renovated building for the MFA Studios is just a block north of us across the street from the park. And throughout the background of my presentation, you'll see before and after pictures. So the project lead was Brock Rasmussen and Tom DiBiasso was the program lead and there were many, many MCAD people who were involved in this project. So thank you to everyone. And this doesn't include all the contractors and the workers and you know, it was an army of people to do this project. It's a 23,000 square foot facility. It was completely remodeled from start to finish in 3.5 months. And the students moved out of Whittier and into this space in just a couple of days at the end of the semester. It includes 50 studios, a classroom, a student lounge, project spaces, a computer lab, 3D small tool shop, and a 3,200 square foot gallery. Um, marking for your calendars, the first public event will be the MFA Open Studios on Friday, March 4th from 6 to 9 p.m. Um, and then the, the MFA thesis show will be in this space. We've been having them off campus for the last number of years, but it'll be in this space in May. And then I also want to make note of another show that's going to come up in, on March 24th. It's at SUVAC, but it's a curated show of, of MFA work in memory of Susie Greenberg, who is an MFA, uh, an, an alum of MCAD and a great supporter of MCAD. So uh, look for that March 24th. So introductions for some new staff. Andrew Schroeder, are you here? Could you stand up, please, right there? Uh, Andrew has joined the continuing education. He's the full-time program coordinator. He comes to us most recently from Augsburg College, where he was a teaching and learning spaces liaison. He has also held positions at MIAD and at Art Institutes International, and he has an MFA in photography from the U of M and a BFA in printmaking from the University of Nebraska. We also have a new part-time academic support coordinator in the Learning Center, Timothy Gardner. Are you here? There he is back there. <laughs> Timothy has nine years experience working with students with disabilities. He was also the director of the LGBTQ services at Lehigh University for five years and has been an adjunct faculty member at St. Cloud State U and other institutions. He holds a BA in psychology from Westfield State College in Massachusetts and an MS in ethnic and multicultural studies from Mankato State. Okay, and then my news piece, just a few, uh, few of the highlights from last fall that are carrying over into spring. We launched the creative writing minor and we already had two students who had enough credits in the right places to uh, earn that minor in the December graduation. Stephen Roof, who is the Director of Entrepreneurial Studies, uh, has been working through uh, reviewing that curriculum through NASA guidelines and many, many informational interviews with faculty, staff, external constituents, businesses, and he's lined up a new two-year partnership for students to work with Pillsbury United Communities on the North Market Hybrid Wellness and Food Market Center, which has been in the news a lot lately, so that'll be a two-year project for MCAT as well. Uh, let's see. Faculty committee has been working on the minor in public practice that's been dragging around for a couple years, but we've been in Cadway, and I think we're going to be able to launch that this spring for a start in the fall, finally. Um, Jay mentioned we commissioned a, a marketing study for product design, so we're analyzing that study now. So the faculty who are on that committee will be starting that up again shortly. We conducted an external peer review of the liberal arts department in the fall and we'll do print paper book again this spring. And print paper book was the one we first started with 10 years ago, so we're coming around <laughs> slowly. 
Continuing Education is partnering with the Green Institute to co-list our Masters in Sustainability with their LEED Sustainability Certificate Program and looking for cross-enrollments between the two of them. And animation is going through an extensive review in how to deliver a very complex curriculum in four years. And the pressure is even greater because the enrollments in that major have nearly doubled in a year. Also coming up the spring semester, again, Jay mentioned HLC. Uh, HLC, the Higher Learning Commission Regional, is not as, um, let's say, community involving as NASAD is. Um, but they, when they come, we don't have their schedule yet, but they can, they will want to meet with many different groups. The, those meetings will be set up, but they also can pull anybody that they see walking in the hallway and pick your brain. So we'll let you know more about that when that starts up or when they're here. Um, NASAD, we are starting, Cole and I are already starting that. That runs kind of underneath here, but our site visit for that is in two years. So it's going to be a lot of more involvement for you all with the NASAD reaccreditation. So uh, Co has been the lead on that, collecting data and mountains of uh, documents for them to basically prove that we are doing the right things in the right way, and that's you know incredibly reductive, but that's basically what it is. Um, academic departments have been working diligently on the curricular parts for the last year and a half, so it's nice to see that coming to an end. Um, let's see what else. Jay mentioned that. Blah blah blah. Um, we're conducting two, f well, you know, whatever, not you, but <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, didn't rehearse that part. Okay, um, we're conducting two full-time uh, faculty searches this spring, one in liberal arts for an art historian with contemporary art, and one in graphic design with user interface, user experience emphasis, and look for those on-campus interviews in March and April. And then, once again, thank you to everybody who came to the session on Tuesday on transgender students on campus and looking forward to working with all of you on improving the campus experience for everybody. So, thank you. I have to read my instructions on how to make it advance. <laughs> oh. oh, Alex, Alex. He said click, click. Here we go. There we go. I'm proud to say that I'm 50 years old. I'm not one of those gals who's afraid to tell a real age. And I like to kick, stretch, and kick. I'm 50. 15 years old. 15 years old. I mean, don't you feel like we're Sally O'Malley sometimes? We can kick. And we can flex, and we know how to stretch. And even though we're mid-year, we're still going, right? Last year alone, last semester, in December alone, $300,000 was brought in. That's $100,000 more than last December. That was only in December. $100,000 for the shop, endowed equipment. We also brought in some money for entrepreneurial studies, $10,000. Two new name scholarship funds were brought in. One for an alum who just graduated in the 90s. Another established for Ari Burt Munzner. I mean, you know these names. These are our alums. These are faculty. They're kicking and stretching. Um, not to mention, we got 10 brand new Mac minis donated for the animation program. And people who help make these things happen are here in this room. 
Scott Bowman working over breaks so this could happen. Every time we go through the shop, the people in there, they stop, they help, they give these tours. I mean, people in my office can spin or turn a phrase. This would not happen without everybody here kicking and stretching. We're all making this happen. Then there's the next magazine. Then there's the capital campaign. 19.3 million dollars in three and a half years. I can assure you, that is a lot of money. That's stretch giving. But as Jay pointed out, we gotta do some more kicking and stretching, right? $8 million for scholarships, $3.2 million to make MLAB happen, $4 million in unrestricted gifts. Some fantastic things happening. Well, whether it's the beginning, whether it's in the middle, MCAD is known for going on and on and on. We talk to our students, we talk to our alumni, and continually they say, they learned how to work and they worked hard, and that's the people in this room. So thank you for working with myself, for working with Jay, for help bringing AMCAD to the front of so many places. Does anybody have any questions? Or, Where can you get one of those red suits? Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, now I can do this. Oh, do we want to hear her again? No. <laughs> okay, Hal, Hal's not here, but uh, thank you. Great to you. We'll see. I don't know. It's just technology. We'll see what we can do. Hey, there we go. So I'm sending in for Hal today because he's out sick, so sadly you have me instead. Um, I have one simple announcement to make. We have a new member in our help desk, our new help desk lead, Tony Mulhern. I believe he's here. If you could stand up, please. Um, Tony joined us from Minneapolis, or the Minnetonka Public School shortly after fall semester started, so he's been working help desk since then, and it's doing a bang-up job, so if you stop by, please say hi. Um, I'm going to spend less than five minutes and talk about some computer security stuff. Essentially, just some quick tips and tricks. We've been seeing more um, incidents of phishing attacks and other attacks against our staff members and faculty here on campus. And I just want to give some tips on how we approach this stuff from an IT standpoint and what, we, what we're expecting from you guys um, in, in regards to this. So essentially, you're all our first line of defense, everybody here. We all have, in some way or another, access to personal student information or critical institutional information. So please understand that the bad guys are going after people like myself or Jay or Pam, but they're also going after all of you guys because it's, it's that one, it's the one entry point is pretty much all they need. So essentially what I want to say is you are literally our first line of defense. So pay attention. If something seems fishy, it probably is. Please let us know. Um, think before replying to a message. It really, a lot of this is, this is not technology. This is human. This is about people. And so if, if you get an email from somebody and it smells fishy, it probably is. Um, if you're getting a, an email that you're not sure the source of, try calling that person by phone instead of replying via email. Just think. It, we'd rather have you err on the side of delaying something than to inadvertently reply to a message that's going to compromise either the school or information or stuff like that. So not trying to scare anybody, but just the idea is you are literally our first line of defense. So keep that in mind. One of the things that we are up against is something called social engineering, which is essentially the ability for the bad guys to play on our desire to help other people to get information out of us. So what will often happen is, for example, and I believe this happened to the director of the CIA, um, so it's not just us, that someone impersonated a technician from his internet service co company to try to get, essentially saying we're doing repairs, whatever the case may be, ended up tricking him out of his password and compromised every account he had. So the idea is, if it feels fishy, it probably is. Um, the piece that I want to bring out about that point is um, MCAD's IT will never ask you for your password. 
I'll say that again, we will not ask you for your password over email or over phone. If someone does, it's fishy, don't do it. Um, the last thing is, and this comes back to our first point, is that we all in some way or another have access to either personal student information, personal staff information, or institutional information. Please be careful with that stuff. We are, we are responsible for protecting this information for our students. So don't save social security numbers to your hard drive. Don't email um, anything personally identifiable. Again, use basic common sense. If you have any questions, please let us know in Help Desk. Um, I also um, could recommend River in Records. It has a really good handle on what we can and can't say. I think Jen in Student Affairs is also another good resource for these things. But the main thing I wanna say, and I've repeated myself enough and I'll stop, you guys are our first line of defense. If it smells fishy, call us. That's all I got. If, I'm sorry, question. Uh, the question is, in, if you get, um, if you're on a mailing list or the unsubscribe link at the bottom of, me of an email, they're generally safe to click on. They don't always work, but they're safe to <laughs> click on. Anybody else? All right, thanks. And again, if you have any questions, please let us know. you've all seen all my slides since Cindy was Cindy <laughs> <laughs> clicking through crazy uh, okay black and white ball that happens every year um, so I I'm not very creative I kind of decided this morning what I wanted to talk about I had so many things to share with you guys so I apologize I'm gonna actually just be reading to you which maybe you guys do in the classroom I don't know so this may be not be anything new um, so our online advising and registration, since Hal's not here, I just want to rethink everybody again for your cooperation on this. It really went as smooth, actually it went better than we anticipated. And again, a thanks to records and IT who really handled the whole thing. There are still some glitchy things that keep popping up, so advisors and faculty, if you see anything, you just let us know. I've been finding them weekly, but they're tiny little things and they're really unique either to um, specific students or classes or reports or something like that. They're, so far they've all been easy fixes, so you just have to keep us posted. We held our first major minor fair that went really great, I think. Um, I, I, you know, after doing it the first time, I know there are things that we will do better the next time, but we had, if, if you're not familiar, in the College Center this past fall, we had tables set up, we had all the faculty, we had the chairs there, and we invited all the students to come and talk to everyone, the faculty and chairs, about the different majors and minors that we have on campus. To me, it was successful because I think we had almost 80 students declare a major right then and there, and then a number more who declared soon after, and they, it, what, what they came out with was, who do we talk to, um, I, I actually think they had more information about the majors than they could get online. So I think it was really beneficial to them. So we'll be doing that again, FYI Chair, so I'll be contacting you about setting up a date for next fall. Uh, just like Pam was mentioning with faculty and staff, all the students were required this fall to do a sexual assault awareness training, so that went into effect. Um, this was our first, this past fall semester was our first full class uh, with the peer mentor group. I like to think that it's gone really well. We had fewer students dismissed this past fall semester, so I like to think it correlates with the peer mentor program. But as we keep doing this, we're gonna keep tracking it. Uh, the peer mentors come back with great information about what's working, what's not. The students are responding with what's working and what's not. So we keep tweaking this through the student success committee. Uh, the internship fair through career services, the uh, employers who were there had good information for us. I know that Magna would like to grow that further, so I don't know if chairs, if you're ever involved with that, because I'm not sure, but um, I know that she's working on making that a bigger event as well. And then we did hire a part-time counselor. Uh, her name is Heather Holt. You may have seen her in the Morrison building. I think she wanders a little bit on her break. She does have a service dog, so if you see her, say hello. She is so friendly. Students are responding well to her. By having her here, though, we have counseling now five days a week rather than four. Woohoo! That's a really big deal. So that's a big change. I know. Yay! Uh, let's see here. So then this past 
December, we held commencement at the uh, Minneapolis Institute of Art in the Target Wing. Um, like the black and white ball, this is where we have been holding the black and white ball the last few falls, I believe. But I think it went well. No one's told me it didn't, so I'm guessing that's a good sign. I don't know how often we really need to do this. That was a big graduating class that we had in December. We had over 60 graduates, which is really unusual. When we have it in here, we have you know, like 25 or 30. So that's what we're talking about. It was a really big group. Um, I'm anticipating about 125 grads for spring and a huge chunk of those uh, are the MFA students. I think there's maybe 30. I don't know if DiBiaso or Kylie, if you're in 33, 33 MFA students in that 125. It's a, it's a big MFA graduating class. Compared to just overall, the 125 grads for spring coming up, um, last spring, we only had 95 grads. So I sort of anticipated that the December class was big because the spring class would be small, but we had, I think, no MFA students graduating in December. So of course, we're gonna have this big group now. So what's coming up for spring? Well, um, with the new intranet and maybe new internet, I've been working with Steven and, and his um, people, but to expand and get more resource information out to students. You know, so much of the information that all of you need, that we need to get students the information they need is in there somewhere, but it's not very accessible in some cases. So we're trying to streamline this a little better, make things a little bit more accessible. So, you know, if a student is looking for, I need to find a, a minute clinic, this is where you could find it then. Uh, we're gonna try to plan some more events around student health, maybe some incentives for them slash bribery to get them to come of these things to, you know, kind of help their overall health and well-being and maybe help them academically as well. Jay mentioned the mental health. Uh, I have to admit, most of my presentation today was going to be about that plan. I got to be honest, I kind of got nothing yet. And I don't mean that in a bad way. This is a work in progress. And even just this past semester working with cabinet, um, faculty, staff, you have students who have such unique situations that I'm trying to think what is the, what's the best use of our resources here? How can we get our bang for the buck that will address the, the issues that we're seeing as staff, uh, the student workers in, the, in our departments and faculty, students not going to class or you, we're just seeing a lot of different issues. And so I'm, I'm sort of have this visual in my head that you're all going to be working on this plan with me in some capacity. And I don't mean that in like a you all gonna sit in a meeting with me and we're gonna do this every month and talk about a health and wellness plan, but I'm thinking more of maybe getting some input. I'm also like to use the students as well. I've had a number of students who have approached me and said, look, I'm, I suffer from depression and I keep this blog. Could we get this out to students so they can see how I'm managing this? I'm like, of course we can. So, I mean, there might be just little things like that that we can kind of use as a community, it's not costing us a lot of money, it might be a little time up front, but if we can get something that's sustainable, it will be beneficial to, to not just the students, but I think all of us as well. Um, with the mental health, uh, oh, I have some kind of downer statistics, do you wanna hear them? <laughs> yeah, probably not. <laughs> but too bad, I'm gonna tell you anyway. So, <laughs> The American College Health Association does a survey every year, and the last big one they did was this past spring. And so what they, they asked students thousands of questions related to every part of their being. But some of them I pulled out was uh, questions about um, their, their mental health. So how overwhelmed did, a student, did students feel in the past 12 months? You know, 87% said they felt overwhelmed. 83% said they were exhausted and not from physical activity. 61% felt very lonely, and I underlined very, and almost 60% um, were struggling with anxiety. <coughs> Added to that, uh, an article that was in the New York Times, the American Psychological Association did a survey of high school students. One in three responded to the survey that stress from school made them feel depressed or sad. So if they're not already struggling from depression, anxiety, and stress before they get here, they most likely are at some point while they're here. Now, the other thing I want to take away from this that, okay, now I'm just going on a whole tangent here, but, but Pam had mentioned this too about our well-being. 
honestly, look, I was overwhelmed and anxious most of last semester. So, but how was I managing this is gonna be different than the way a 19 year old is gonna manage this. So what are the tools that they need so they can get through? Because it's not gonna be the same thing that a lot of us probably use. And I, I know I'm not the only one who was struggling with these things last semester. It was a tough semester. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. This is gonna be a bigger, a, a bigger plan than just student affairs. Let's put it that way. You've been warned. Um, let's see, the Emerging Talent Showcase is May 6th and today students are moving in and tomorrow is orientation. So I just wanna remind you that, you know, just something with new students, a, a, especially new students and students who are returning from break who maybe this is their first year, they're still working out the homesickness feelings and now they've just come back from break, mom and dad have been doing everything for them for the last month and now they're gonna show up in your media too, drawing too in your intro to comics class. You know, just remember a kind word, a gesture will go an awful long way with these students, especially as they're getting acclimated or reacclimated. So I'll leave you with that. Have a great semester. And if you have any questions about the, the health and wellness thing, I'm happy to talk about it anytime. So thank you, everybody. Hi, everyone. Happy New Year, welcome back. Uh, I don't have a bunch of slides for you today, lucky you. I just have a few updates. Um, first, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone that's helped us this past semester with our recruitment efforts. That's the program directors, uh, faculty, academic services, the cafeteria, facilities, and many other staff. Without all of you, we really can't pull off these events, so we really, really appreciate that. Uh, spring enrollment, which I know you're all waiting with bated breath to hear. Uh, we're on track uh, with new enrollment and we're welcoming a total of 43 new students to the undergraduate, graduate, and professional programs, which is a 60% increase in new enrollment over last spring 2015. So let that sink in a little bit. <laughs> So good job, admission counselors. Uh, total undergraduate student enrollment is on par with expectations and is showing a 5% increase over spring 2015. So the halls are gonna feel a little more crowded this spring. Uh, in admissions, fall 2016 enrollments trending positively were a 22% increase in our undergraduate applications and a 37% uptick in our undergraduate admits compared to the same time last year. So we're trending in the correct direction. Uh, counselors are working hard completing applications and recruiting for the next benchmark, which is our upcoming February 15th priority deadline. Uh, the graduate and professional programs, first deadline for fall 2016 is tomorrow. So they are working diligently getting those apps and processing them. In financial aid, they've been working with our new and returning students, making sure that they're all set for spring semester, and then they'll be preparing for the FAFSA deadline, which will be coming up very soon, uh, March 1st for new student students and April 1st for continuing and returning students. And finally, as you've seen, Web Communications is working towards the completion of the MCAD.edu, or excuse me, internet, not intranet. We already completed that one. And so I'll turn it over to Steven so he can talk about that. Thank you. Good afternoon. As I hope you're all aware, or at least some of you are aware, for the past year we've been working on a redesign of MCAD.edu. Um, some of the main objectives of the redesign are to make the site responsive to all types of devices, finally, and as well as to better reflect the activity and vitality of everything in ev that happens at MCAD and everything that's created at MCAD. So for fun, first I'm going to load up our good old friend. So this is a site that we have been using for the last five years. Um, and now I'm going to pull up a development version of the new site. It's in a super top secret location that you're never going to be able to find. <laughs> Let me pull this up a little bit. So on the home page, we, uh, we have this space for what we're calling an interactive header. This space will change out every week, every other week, something like that. This is just an example of what we've been using for development. It doesn't really scratch the surface of what I see this space being used for. We'll be rolling out this space for use for uh, students, faculty, classes, alumni, any sort of web art type project, moving graphic image type things that we want to do. I think there's going to be a lot of potential for it. Out of the interactive header, we are choosing a primary site color that'll switch out on a relatively frequent basis as well. Here we're using a pretty default HTML blue. So the blue that's represented here in the interactive header 
will then reflect throughout the site as links, highlights, and some other things like that. The content on the homepage is a feed of news, features, exhibitions, um, alumni profiles, some testimonial-based quotes, and things of that nature. We have these tabs, so if you want to filter out exactly what you're looking for, you can get just news, just events, uh, just features, which are the more in-depth stories that are written by our student reporters in web communications, uh, stories that are just about alumni, and just our exhibitions. As you scroll through the page, our primary action items, our top tasks that we need admitted students to, or potential students to do are always locked here on the right side of the screen with you, so they're never too far away to apply for admission, request a view book, or do your net price calculator. And we also have a calendar of events that are coming up for other audience as well. My footer apparently is way down here. Uh, we also have some additional information in the footer as well as some audience gateways for some additional audience. So alumni will have a page specifically for them while we'll also have opportunities for alumni, um, so, sorry, employers and parents as well. That's the home page. Uh, quickly, I'll jump in over to an academic program page. Ignore the white, the gap on the side of the navigation. That's just, that'll be going away tomorrow. Uh, this is an active development site, so if you figure out how to get here and poke around, you will see things that are changing, and we'll be continuously testing and improving on the site over the course of the next year, so it'll be never too late to give us some feedback, and I'll get to a little bit more of that in the future in, in a couple minutes here. Um, the landing pages for the academic program serve as a place for people to land on the site from Google, other places like that. We have about 15 seconds with a potential student for them to read this page, comprehend it, and decide that they want to stay for longer than that. So these pages are really designed to give a brief overview of what the program is, a video testimonial from a recent alumni or current student, as well as some bulleted points of what is covered in that major, as well as some spotlights on alumni or faculty who are currently teaching. Uh, and then you click through the additional tabs and we have in-depth information and including the, um, your specific mission statements for each major will be listed here as well as a four-year overview of what happens in the program and each course description breakdown for each department as well as student work. Um, this will only be pretty small. We haven't added a lot in web yet. People, empty, nice. Um, and a list of potential careers. So this is really, compared to the current website, pulling things from a lot of different areas on the old site where student work was in one area, potential clears was another, profiles are in this other area, really trying to pull everything together around a single major and kind of show everything all at once. Which brings me to what you guys can do to help us make this even better. Um, I've sent out an email just a few minutes ago um, about some feedback sessions that are coming up uh, starting a week from today and the following week after that. Um, we'll be holding noontime sessions in the emeritus room to go over a more in-depth presentation of the new site um, and have a, a, a more of a dialogue about what you can expect from it over the course of the next year. Um, and uh, as always, we need your help to s create some of the best content for the site. So that is news and ideas for feature stories. So if you have, uh, you can use the submit news functionality on the current site. Um, it's just a really quick form that you kind of give us a couple of bullet points about what's going on. Um, if you can rat out your friends and alumni of the cool things they're doing as well, I find self-promotion is hard for a lot of people. So if you hear of something cool going on, we won't tell them that you told us. Um, we also need stu more student work. Um, this semester we have, in, on the coursework server currently, we have 90 classes that have work in them compared to the previous semester of only about 30. So a lot more people are uploading the coursework to the coursework server and I really appreciate it. Makes it really easy for us to grab that work and put it up on the site. Um, we'll also be updating your faculty profiles with the headshots that have been taken over the course of the last two semesters, but we also post examples of work on those pages. We'll be sending out individually links to your faculty profiles for you to review, and at that point, if you could send us some work for those pages, that'd be great. Um, and if you can recommend any alumni from your program to be profiled, uh, that'd be great as well. We're going on a, about two a month rate of profiling alumni for the web, and the more we can do that, the better we'll be. That's all. Thanks a lot. And Dylan? 
All right, so I believe I get to wrap this up um, with one new or one last new hire announcement. So please join me in welcoming Rita Kovtun. She is our newest member to DesignWorks. So she joined us this fall and comes to us as a recent graduate from the University of St. Thomas, where she received, or where she um, double majored in communication and journalism, as well as justice and peace studies, um, as well as double major, and she's also received a number of awards. I'm just gonna highlight a couple, um, or at least one of them, which is the Julie Friedlein Award for Top Communication and Journalism um, for graduating seniors. Um, she also is on Dean List, the Dean's List every semester. She speaks three languages, Russian, French, and English, and plays the guitar, piano, and sings. So please join me with a round of applause for Rita. Rita, are you gonna come up here and <laughs> serenade us? <laughs> Maybe next time, okay, fair enough. Um, well, thank you everybody who presented today for um, uh, informing uh, all of us about what's going on in your areas. And uh, uh, are there any other, uh, is Barb here, Barb Schultz? Do you have anything for faculty senate, faculty in general to announce or? Well, and uh, I, I think it's exciting to have our students coming back to campus. I've seen a few people drifting in over the last few days, so they're, they're starting to come back. Somebody said to me when I said, uh, you know, how was your break? He said, well, it was okay, but I'm really anxious to start my classes again. You know, I, I really want to get going. It's like I'm frustrated. <laughs> so I, th I thought that was great. Um, very exciting to have students eager to get started again, and uh, you know I think there'll be a lot of good energy, uh, even if it's moving at a glacial pace because of the chilly weather that's outside. I think it's supposed to hit minus 18 on Sunday, but uh, uh, anyway, um, <laughs> war warm up for next week, <laughs> and uh, thank you all for being here, and thank you for all you do for MCAD. <laughs>